when you got started with PandaDoc, what was the opening that you saw in the market? We didn't really see uh, any kind of opening in the market. We didn't think about the market starting uh, what preceded PandaDoc. Just had an internal need, a problem that we wanted to solve. Um, and we went ahead and solved it. Um, I would not advise this to be <laughs> the um, to be the, like as as a, as a way to uh, start a company. Uh, however, uh, you know, I was uh, twenty four. My co founder was twenty five, and um, we didn't know any better. What was the problem you were trying to solve? Uh, generation of sales proposals. Uh, this one summer, I went to US and left Sergey, my co-founder, with uh, this mundane task of uh, building sales proposals. And he thought, hey, there, there, there's got to be a better way. And similar to many other teams that want to build a product, build something, we had a few ideas in the run. Um, this was the most promising one. This one made the most sense and uh, we decided to pursue it further and further and further. Um, and that's how our first B2B SaaS product, uh, which was quite similar to PandaDoc, but, uh, but a lot narrower, uh, came to light. Then we made a ton of mistakes uh, building business around this like narrow product. Uh, building software behind it, and uh, that helped us to uh, to learn and then think about a broader market, think about uh, opportunities in that broader market, and that's what uh, helped us to create PandaDoc. What was uh, the what yeah. were the problems? Uh, the problems the problems were that. Uh, at the time, and we're talking about 12 years ago, uh, say for sales proposals, uh, you mainly had word for um, writing them, managing templates, and then uh, you had to copy paste a lot. Uh, you had to copy and paste data from CRM that once that proposal was accepted, signed, and all the back and forth with customers, uh, have been done yet to move data back into the CRM, store that proposal somewhere somehow, uh, ensure that the sales reps don't get creative with pricing and discounting and all that good stuff. Uh, that's where we built the original product for. Um, then we learned that, hey, same set of problems or similar problems exist in the world of contracts and uh, um, in the world of like SOWs and a bunch of other transactional documents that help uh, companies agree among each other. So we decided to uh, streamline this workflow, streamline this process and uh, make agreeing on a set of terms a lot easier and a lot faster. That was the thesis behind PandaDoc. Well, tell me about the road to first million dollars in, in revenue. How did you land customers? What channels uh, worked back then? That was a windy road, dude. One windy road. Well, um, <laughs> as many uh, entrepreneurs, we thought we're going to build it and they will come. And you know what? They actually came. This first product we launched, uh, we made it free. We thought, well, like, why would we invest so much time uh, and efforts creating billing? Let's just build a bunch of features. They will come. Then we'll have time and resources to build billing. And they will pay. So they will come and they will pay. So what happened is they, they did come. However, once we got to, and we had about 3,000 users uh, after a few months after the launch. Um, then we started working on billing and uh, thought that we're going to convert anywhere from 20 to 30% of those free users. Well, guess what? Out of 3,000, we converted six. That's it. So we built it. They came. 
but they quite not were ready to pay. And that was a big bummer because at the time, Sergey and I invested all of our savings into this thing and we didn't really have any more left. Um, it, was a, it was a huge bummer. And <laughs> all that time, like we were working on it, we, we've been arguing and focusing on the wrong things, like, you know, the, the shapes and colors of the buttons, stuff and stuff. Um, so yeah, that, that was a windy road. Um, then we realized that, hey, we probably don't really know much. Like we're, we thought we know what's needed in the market, what customers, what's that need? What is that customers are ready to pay for? And we were completely wrong, completely clueless. So instead of like making a bunch of assumptions, we, we got ourselves into the field and uh, we started talking to clients. Uh, we started asking what is that we can do so that, you know, you'll spare a couple dozen dollars a month. Um, and that helped us to pivot the product numerous times and just like real slowly, it was first uh, $1,000 in MRR, then it was $5,000 in MRR, then it was $25,000 in MRR, at which point we uh, raised seed fun uh, funding and then we slowly climbed to about $100,000. What channels used to work back then? Did you were you banking on uh, like SEO, pay per click, or were you doing outbound, or what was it like? At the time, um, I had a very thick Eastern European accent, and uh, for some reason, I thought that this is not going to enable me to sell direct. Like I, I was. Um, and, and I tried, like, it's not like, like I didn't try. I tried that. It did not work. So instead of uh, further pursuing direct sales, uh, we switched to digital marketing and uh, all kinds of uh, um, startup blogs where you announce and launch your thing and then uh, review marketplaces. Then we integrated with uh, a number of CRM systems, which made sense. Our product extended CRMs um, in a way, right? And that all, like all of those little tries and attempts and uh, investments uh, helped us to build, uh, slowly but surely, build a decent inbound um, flow of leads. And then with those folks, we've uh, engaged in conversations and uh, at times run a traditional sales motion. Um, that, that's, that was the story of, um, with the product that preceded PandaDoc. With PandaDoc, it was slightly different uh, because we learned that since we did not have a lot of, uh, did not spend a lot of time in front of customers and did not learn from customers uh, and did not uh, enough, did not learn from customers enough, we, we, we took a different approach. Uh, PandaDoc was not built um, yet. We had designs and the, the vision, the concept. Yet I've started to pretty much sell those designs to folks who um, either used our previous product or uh, checked it out and decided not to buy and so on and so forth. Like I had a list of those folks and uh, I want to say like I had uh, 60, 90 accounts in the pipeline that I pursued through the traditional sales motion. It was a mix of like trying to get feedback and uh, trying to sign contracts uh, for annual subscription uh, under the condition that we're going to build this thing and launch this thing. And that, like, the, the value of this was not the contracts that we signed. The value of this was that during those conversations and uh, uh, during those conversations, we harvested a ton of uh, insights and uh, feedback and ideas and so on and so forth. 
how did you use those ideas then to um, shape the vision for the business? And, and how did your uh, product and marketing strategy then evolve over time? Um, well, if you're talking about hundreds of different insights and ideas, uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty challenging to like, um, translate every single one of them into well, if you had to pick let's say um, three to five you know like key insights that were like pivotal like oh we need to our product needs to go this way and our marketing needs to evolve that way can you think of some like critical insights that you got and then how how your uh product strategy evolved based on that and, and marketing strategy yeah sure um originally we thought that um, Panadoc is going to be more of a um, individual use product, the kind of like. Um, but during those interviews, we learned that collaboration among the team members and and the teamwork and standardization of the process of uh, dealing with proposals and contracts are a lot more important and bring a lot more value to uh, those prospective customers. We also learn is that um, integrability of the solution with uh, other tools uh, is, is, is key to the success. And we, so basically the allocation of resources, the kind of features we decided to build, uh, pricing, uh, all of those were influenced by face time with customers. Yeah, in terms of marketing, I wouldn't say that um, that a lot has changed uh, since, even though we layered many more marketing channels and uh, uh, introduced a lot more supporting channels to inbound and, and, and SEO and SEM and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, we're still an inbound driven business. Um, 95 plus percent of pin docs revenue comes through inbound um we like it uh but at the same time it's not like we got there by choice <laughs> like we uh, back in the day being in eastern europe it was just uh, challenging to build uh, a direct sales team uh we had no know-how and uh uh, we don't really have any people in our networks that can help us get that know-how. So yeah, we relied on inbound. Uh, we remain to be in inbound product-led, uh, as they see here in the Valley, business. Uh, and that works just fine. What was the moment in, in Pandadoc's um, you know, history where uh, things just kind of clicked and uh, you started to make you know, started to grow much faster than you had been growing before. You know what? I get asked that, but I don't think that we had this one night or like this one month where things changed all of a sudden. Our business uh, has been an incremental um uh, has been an, 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 one of those incremental stories. Um, mm -hmm. This little thing adds up to that little thing. And then yet another day comes and something else comes around and we just like slowly, slowly, slowly climbed the, uh, the ladder. Um, there were a few, like, there were a few launches that worked out really well uh like when COVID hit for a l very long time we've been arguing uh, whether uh launching free electronic signing solution is going to be good or bad for the business on one hand it uh, positions us strongly in the market against like largely signature players because what they do we offer for free 
uh, and potentially opens up top of the funnel. On the other hand, uh, we thought we can we we, we were going to kind of uh, cannibalize uh, some of our revenue, and that's you know it's scary to make a part of your product free. And then the COVID hits, and we decide, just like many other companies at the time, we were thinking about ways to help the community. We decide to do it uh, fast then and there uh, as sort of a response, because how else are you going to sign documents during COVID and, and lockdowns? Uh, yeah, so the launch of free electronic signing uh, gave us a boost for sure. However, and it was it was uh, it was a good thing for the business. But it's not like we doubled PandaDoc because of this one thing. If you look at the, the space that you're in today, uh, and uh, assuming the strategies, you know, uh, where to play, like which kind of customers you're going after and, and, and how to win, what is your theory of advantage? Like how are you going to win against the competition? Um. Oh, two things. One, uh, we believe in an all-in-one solution for contract management, uh, proposal automation, doc gen, um, forms, and so on and so forth. Like, we don't think that um, we think that over time businesses will be consolidating. Uh, the tools that are needed to uh, to transact with customers and uh, to come to agreements with customers, like basically uh, in legal, in sales, in HR, uh, we believe that uh, when it comes to contracts uh, and any kind of forms of contracts, there will be and should be one solution. And from the very, very beginning, we uh, we positioned ourselves and uh, built a product so that it can be an all-in-one uh, system. And uh, unlike many other folks, we did not build PandaDoc on top of PDF or Word or any other file format. Like we believe that the files, um, you know, slowly but surely are going to uh, are going to be gone. And uh, um, the way we've created PandaDoc is that documents are digital, documents are editable, you can collaborate on it. Of course, you can sign them. Of course, you can like inject functionality in, but um, they're sort of cloud native. They're born in the cloud, they live in the cloud, they're going to stay in the cloud. So that's how we're different uh, from other folks out there in the market. And uh, um, or maybe you know it's like it's it's how we think of ourselves. The way customers think about ourselves is that uh, they say, "Oh, PandaDoc is just easy. It's easy. It's easy. It's easy." So, are you, are you thinking uh, about? We try to stay true to that. Are you, are you thinking about moats, like uh, long-term sustainable competitive advantages? Because if you think about like easy, that's kind of easy to copy if if they really want it to. Uh, so, what what are you are you building yeah, any yeah, moats? Are you thinking about you, moats? You would think, Pep, you would think that easy is easy to copy. And if you look at the uh, at the top SMB SaaS players, easy is not easy to copy. It is actually not. Um, yeah, I, of course, like I can talk about, you know, the data and AI and this and that and whatever, but at the end of the day, what I believe in uh, is when it comes to um, B2B software, uh, just one mode is, 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 is not enough. Like, um, like what's Salesforce's mode from your perspective? Uh, today, two things, brand and uh, ecosystem. Okay, I would agree that ecosystem um, is a mode, but then brand is like 
every 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 publicly traded uh, SaaS company is going to have a brand, right? Like well, most, in terms of right, people most. know, everybody knows that Salesforce exists, uh, which is like the starting point. If you're a small startup and people don't know you exist, that's you know you don't have anything. Um, and 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 second is like. It's it's the default, right? If you're gonna go with a CRM, we're gonna go with Salesforce. It, it's like that. All right. So and and the second up runner, HubSpot. What about those guys? Yeah, I think HubSpot. I think their positioning does not overlap one to one. There's there's some overlap, but HubSpot is a uh, for a much smaller, let's say, mid market versus which is a uh, um, operating mid market enterprise. Mm-hmm. And how about pipe drive? SMBs. SMBs. That's how. It well, goes. I'm sure HubSpot would argue that they're um, also SMB focused and also a market focused. And uh, I'm sure Salesforce would argue, "Hey, we grew out of SMB. Like that's we have uh, this many accounts and this much ARR and blah 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 blah." So. So yeah, like you know, the market focus is important, but the like I don't know what, what I've been observing is that many companies start at the bottom of the market, uh, and then they're slowly progressing up, slowly mm-hmm. moving up market. Totally. And um, in terms of their unfair competitive advantages, there are typically a few. There are typically a few of those. Um, is Pandadoc uh, going up market as well? Uh, yeah. When we launched Pandadoc, we targeted companies that have less than 20 employees. That's Those, those were the only customers that our product was like truly uh, good for. And then a year later, it was targeting companies with less than 50 employees. And then... Few years down the line, less than 100 employees. Few years down the line, less than 200 employees. Now, like less than 500 employees, and then larger companies with simple uh, workflows. But like, yeah, as as the depth of the product grows, um, we become more and more feasible and ready for larger accounts, larger businesses. Two last questions. Uh, one. Strategic trade-offs. Where have you um, prioritized something, uh, and in order to prioritize that, you have deprioritized something else? What are some 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 examples? Customer focus. Um, when I said that once we launched Painted Arc, we focused on companies of that size or this size, and blah blah blah. That means that we didn't focus on the other cohorts of, of businesses and did not invest resources to do A, B, C, and whatever. Uh, so that's been a continuous sort of uh, trade-off and, and, and internal. It was a part of many internal negotiations. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you my last final question. You've been building this business for over 10 years now. What are some pieces of advice you would give to other B2B SaaS founders uh, based on your lessons learned? Mm. Uh, I'll give uh, two. One, uh, think about your successes and failures through a prism of not like a three-year cycle, planning cycle, or in a five-year planning cycle, because in B two B SaaS, like you get involved, you're committing to a long haul. Like a re- I did not realize that when I was 24. I read TechCrunch, and you know things happen so quickly there, and just like I thought that phew, two more years. Uh, and something is going to happen, right? Like, and that's just not necessarily the case in, in B2B SaaS. Sometimes it is, but um, not always. And, and frankly, like, 
I mean, I'd be actually uh, the, the best for the team, for the founder. Um, so yeah, so like this long haul, long term commitment uh, is, is what I think is important. Uh, and that comes, comes along with long term planning. And therefore, uh, to get to my second advice, be optimistic. It's okay, you know, you got rejected here and there, you know, maybe for one month, for two months, for three months, for six months. It doesn't really, like, matter if you think about a a time span of, like, 10 years. Uh, I remember raising our seed round and uh, getting at least, like, 200, more likely 300 rejections. And uh, I thought, like, at some point, I thought that whatever it is that we're working on makes absolutely no sense because, like, nobody wants it. But that was not the case. It was just, like, it was a combination of uh, me doing a poor job selling the vision and the story and yada, 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 as well as, like, timing and uh, where we were and just a bunch of different factors. So, yeah, so, like, Commit to a long-term play and uh, be optimistic. And yeah, and, and I feel like in B2B SaaS, um, if you are into something uh, for a long ride, good things are bound to happen. Uh, because like there are so many niches and so many different like corners of that B2B world and yeah, you may not build like a multi-billion dollar company, but like you you will build a company and you will figure out a way to deliver customer value as long as you um, stay focused and uh, surround yourself with really good people and uh, um, sort of go at it hard for a long enough time.